Hi, my name is Sean McManus from Telecom TV. I am at the Open Networking and Edge Summit, and I'm joined now by Rani Haby from the Linux Foundation. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, thanks, hi. We're hearing that agentic AI is a really hot topic at the moment. Tell us a bit about what it means for telecom operators and how it can help them to run the network. Yeah, so it's a good question. I must preface, preface by saying that we're all still trying to wrap our mind around it uh, and trying to keep up with the pace of uh, hype in the AI world. But I think to me, when I hear agentic AI, the difference between other types of AI is AI that can actually take actions and do things automatically. And that brings us closer to what we like to call autonomous networks. So uh, when we think about agentic AI, we imagine things like um, actions that are currently being taken by humans. Uh, and these humans may already be using some sort of AI to kind of get recommendations and ask questions and get answers, but agentic AI takes it to the next level where the human is pretty much taken out of the loop. And things that were traditionally done by humans, like changing configurations, restarting systems, uh, tweaking the network, uh, think about all the stuff that traditionally was done at the NOC, the Network Operation Center. A lot of that can be replaced by AI with the aid of uh, agents. So these agents can act as, as the, the uh, in, replace the humans and take the actions um, and make sure the network is run properly and even get the network to run better than the way it was run by humans because they have all the uh, knowledge of the AI at their disposal. So we're hopeful that that would bring uh, new opportunities to network and kind of make the way networks are run and operated and, and uh, maintained much more efficient because the AI can do things much more efficiently than a human. But what are the risks of using AI in the network? Yeah, so with any kind of technology that consumes data, there are many risks related to how the data is flowing and what type of data is flowing where. Um, so that's kind of one type of risk of controlling your data and making sure what you're sending to the AI is not sensitive. For example, if there are uh, privately identifiable information, PII, that exists in your network and you want to use some AI algorithm, you need to make sure that the data you're sending, especially if it's a, uh, an algorithm that runs on a public cloud, say, for example, you need to make sure that the data going out does not include this very sensitive information. So that's uh, on the data side. The other aspect of, of risk or um, dangers in AI is how do you make sure that the response generated by the AI is really trustworthy. So there are mechanisms for um, validating the responses and everybody is by now I think familiar with the concept of hallucinations. So that's one thing you want to weed out, weed out the hallucinations of, of these AI models. Um, so we just announced a project called Salus that is going to deal with um, many of these challenges which are common, not just to telecom, but I think we are launching it with specifically telecom use cases in mind. And Salus is going to be um, a set of tools and methodologies that are consumable by API that can be applied when you use AI to make sure A, your data is, is uh, sent securely and not containing this sensitive information, and also that the model uh, returns a response that is trustworthy and you can act upon. So these are kind of the two main focus areas for this new project, and we hope it's an open source project, so we hope there will be a community around it that will help grow it and, and add more functionality. Great, so that's bringing guardrails effectively to the network. Yeah, a lot of it is, is guardrails, but a few other things like validating models and scoring models and, and benchmarking models for, for their accuracy and things like that. Now you've also announced here Essidum as another project. Uh, tell us a bit about the problems for operators that that aims to solve. Yeah, so Essendum is aiming to address the, I would say, the uh, common parts of building AI applications and solutions for telecoms. Um, I think every organization that is 
building or developing an application usually deals with some common layers like how to access the data, how to do some pre-processing, how to plug in the models. And this is where, not where the differentiation is. So everybody wants to differentiate, be ahead of the pack and uh, innovate. But like maybe 80, 90 percent of the work is just very common parts that are repeated over and over again. So SADM is uh, attempting to make that much more efficient. Uh, we had a generous uh, code contribution from one of our member companies, Infosys, that did that internally and felt exactly that. Why should we do it over and over again where we can have a common thing that we can reuse in the form of an open source project? So that's the goal of SADM, to provide these common layers that everybody needs when they develop AI applications or services for their network while still letting them innovate and differentiate on kind of the higher layer, the application layer. So hopefully that will be an accelerator for adopting uh, AI more easily for, for telecom applications. Tell us about the timescales for these two projects. Yeah, um, so Salus is pretty much available today uh, I think the seed code is being transitioned as we speak uh, to a Linux Foundation hosted GitHub repo. So that should be available uh, to anyone interested starting probably tomorrow. Uh, for SDM, we're taking a more cautious approach. We're trying to figure out exactly what we need to bring and what are exactly these building blocks of this framework that we need. So we have some uh, potential contributions or uh, code repos sitting at Infosys, but we're not sure which of them needs to come over. We also have started a technical steering committee for the project, uh, which includes folks from Infosys, but also from Red Hat and uh, hopefully other companies. And they're kind of bringing a broader perspective of what might work best for the community and what components we need. So we expect that the next following weeks or months will be dedicated to kind of architecting what needs to come there and within two to three months we'll probably have the first significant drop of code that people can actually start uh, working with but in the meantime we welcome anyone to join this conversation that we're um, uh, managing in the technical steering committee it's open everything that the Linux foundation does is in the open so everybody is welcome to join the mailing list and express their opinion and contribute to that discussion of what needs to be the scope of the project and again the uh, expected eta for the actual code is about uh, something like 10 weeks that's brilliant thank you so much yeah thank you